Welcome back to Tom's World Scale Model Series. In this episode, we undertake the construction phase of our Tamiya M5A1 Light Stewart Tank. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. Our unboxing revealed a quality, albeit older generation kit. Still, all the Tamiya fundamentals were there. Clear instructions, nice molding, value-adding accessories, and a manageable part count. But as our build reveals, the kit suffers from design compromises. Originally released in the 70s as a motorized model, this kit lacks the tight joinery and attention to detail that Tamiya's modern kits offer today. But we love a challenge. So stick with us as we massage this bygone era kit into a display model we can be proud of. It's been many years since I've built one of these older generation Tamiya kits. Our M5 Spruce can be traced back to the late 70s, so the kit is a good example of these older generation products. Back when I was a kid building models, we were willing to forgo the bottomless sponsons, melt together tracks, molded on detail and motorization remnants in the hulls. Newer kit innovations including slide molding, turn barrels, photo etch, individual and length and length tracks were still years away. But for all the shortcomings of these older kits, it didn't seem to dampen the fun and enjoyment we got from building and playing with them. Today we're spoiled by recent innovations in plastic injection molding and kit accessories. So I was interested in seeing how Tamiya's 70s era kit engineering and molding would hold up today. Before I build a kit, I like to scour the internet for free reference material. I found this gem of a site, Internet Archive, and I dug up this M3 technical manual. If we just scroll down here, we can get at the files. I downloaded the PDF. Our M5 differs from the M3, but they share the same running gear and suspension, and we'll be referring to this manual later. But every detail is here. The driver's instrument panel, machine gun mount, hoisting the transmission, and good details on the bogies and suspension. I managed to find this maintenance manual for the M5A1's engines, cooling, and fuel system. We find the M24, our M5, the M8, and this M19 duster referenced in the manual, so they must share the same engines. And there it is. It's not referenced in the text, but this must be one of the Cadillac V8s. A pair of these drive our M5. Manuals like these are fascinating and a great companion if we decide to super detail our kit. We always want to inspect our parts as we get them off the sprue trees. Parting lines are found on practically all injection molded plastic parts, so we can't fault Tamiya here. A few relaxing strokes of our sanding sticks makes short work of these mold seams. In the 70s, Tamiya used to motorize some of their armor models. In our M5, we can see evidence of where the batteries, gearbox, and switch were installed in the hull. Later boxings like ours don't include the gearboxes or hardware. Here are a couple of examples of what these little gearboxes look like, although they're not from our M5 kit. And this is what these gearboxes look like when installed in the Panther model. To me, it did release a motorized World War I British Mark IV tank in 2014 but these motorized kits are likely not going to be making a comeback anytime soon. Our hull sides have these huge holes where the gearbox drive would poke through, and our drive sprockets have these hexagonal depressions where the nuts that connect the drive rod lock into. A drive fit of the superstructure to the hull reveals another 70s design feature, and that is bottomless sponsons. Also, the bottom of the hull has a hole for a switch. All these holes let light into the hull, if you pose your hatches open or plan on entering your M5A1 in a contest, these holes should definitely be sealed up. Step 1 has us install that nasty looking hedge cutter. As a kid I always thought the cutter was an anti-personnel device, I guess a nasty way of mowing down the bad guys. 
Well, no wonder mother was worried about me. We get these plugs to seal up those gaping final drive holes. All you modern kit builders are probably recoiling from the nasty seam here, but to me it's got us covered. The drive sprocket obscures most of the bottom of the joint, with the fender hiding the rest. My dry fit of the hull and superstructure revealed a slight misfit, but a little filing on the bottom edge of the hull corrected the fit. Our bogey assembly builds up with six major parts. There is a seam on the bogey links and the front surfaces are noticeable on the finished model. These seams should be sanded or scraped off. I'm not a bolt counter and bless those of you who are, but uh, we're kind of dragged into some bolt controversy in the instructions. If we look closely, we're instructed to cut a couple of bolts off the top of the bogey plates. I studied a few photographs of the actual vehicle and most showed these bolts intact. We see four bolts total confirmed here in our operating manual. To further confound the problem, our box art shows six bolts. My best guess as to why we're supposed to remove these bolt heads is to accommodate this kind of weird arrangement where the bogey tops are molded onto the fenders. According to this photo, this is how these tops are supposed to mate with the bogies. Jumping ahead a little in the build, here's how these fender bogey tops mated with the bogies on my model. The fit isn't great. When we attach our bogies to the hull, we have to make sure they align with the fender and its bogey caps which get attached later. Otherwise, once built up, the bogey assemblies look great. They're not workable and most builders will choose to glue everything together. I left the wheels loose so I could remove them to ease painting. And here are all the parts that constitute the running gear, all cleaned up and ready for assembly. I griped about the return skids being too thick in our unboxing video. I dug up these resin cast ones out of an old Verlinden M3 upgrade kit. If I was going to enter my little M5 in a contest, I'd probably replace the kit provided skids with these resin ones. And step 4, it shows us the installation of that huge idler wheel assembly. We get good contact points on the hull including this mounting hole. If we look closely, we can see the hole is obstructed by the bottom of the hull plate. A dry fit of the idler arm mounting shows this blocked hole prevents us from seating the arm properly. I cleared the hole by gently reaming it out with a pin vise. This ensures our idler wheel runs straight, true and parallel to our hull. Our turret builds up with several parts. The fit is good in general. Elastic bands come in handy to hold parts in place while our glue sets up. The turret buildup permits the gun to elevate. If we're careful with our glue placement and assembly, the little 37 caliber elevates and depresses freely. As our unboxing video revealed, the 30 caliber machine guns that come with the kit are crudely sculpted and molded. This is how the Browning 1919 actually looks. Note the cooling holes on the shroud. Our kit barrels look like they have octopus suction cups on them. I rummaged through my stash and found replacements for the kit's rather abysmal 30s. Here is the exquisite 1919 we had left over from our Mang Willys Jeep. I also had a couple of these left over from an old Academy M3 kit. They look good but they're missing the barrels. But I had a few brass ones, not sure of the manufacturer. These are gorgeous and come with the shroud and barrel as separate pieces. And I also found this little gem. I'd have to strip off the gnarly paint, but it's got that cool older mounting trunnion on it. It's tempting to clag on aftermarket parts onto our M5, but we'll resist for the video so we can judge the kit on its own merits. The kit has quite a few tiny grab handles, lifting eyes and towing clevises to clean up and install. 
Notwithstanding the patience and dexterity these parts will require, the holes they mount into are often oversized. In this case, only a tiny gap can be seen. In other places, the misfit is really bad. It's probably best to fill these holes before attaching the handles. Attaching the handles first, like I did, required time-consuming and at times frustrating filling to fix the nastiest gaps. The exterior of the machine gun shield has a very faint raised witness mark. Nothing gets attached here and the shields on the real vehicle are actually smooth. We gently sand the surface to remove the witness mark. A smooth gun shield is a happy gun shield. A dry fit of the shield reveals a gap that we'll have to fill. On the real vehicle, the shield was welded on with a noticeable bead where our gap is. To lessen the gap, I gently sanded the inside edge of the shield where it mates with the turret side. Alternating between dry fitting and gently sanding a few times, we reduce the gap considerably. We'll put the weld bead on later. The biggest mistake in this kit, and it's a doozy, are the end connectors on the tracks. Can you spot the issue? Referring to our operating manual, we can see that the tracks are individual pads which each have two posts on their ends. This image shows how the track links are connected together. The end connectors are supposed to be mounted in between the links, like this. But on our Tamiya tracks, they're mounted like this. If the mounting connectors were attached, like in the Tamiya track, the links would actually fall apart. I missed this error in our unboxing video, and I have to thank Miko Michela, a member of one of my Facebook groups, for pointing out the error. Another albeit minor issue is the coax machine gun. It's a stubby little post thing that slips into a pocket in the mantlet. The coaxial's bearer is supposed to run through a hole in the front of the turret and through the mantlet. But the gap between the mantlet and front turret face shows that our barrel doesn't protrude into the turret. For the sake of time, we'll leave this error intact, but conscientious builders should address this issue. The instructions suggest making the antenna out of stretched sprue. Melted and pulled sprue does make a convincing antenna. And we even get the built-in taper. But pulled sprue like this is very fragile. It does bend and too often breaks off too easily. Instead I use guitar strings. Since I play guitar there's always bits of old string lying around. It comes in various gauges so we select the size that best suits our model. These wires are stiff just like real antennas. They spring back when bent and won't break off. The drawback is their uniform in diameter without any taper. It's a little tricky to get the strings attached to plastic, but with a little 5 minute epoxy and patience, our antenna is ready to be installed on the turret. We're not going to install the antenna to the turret, we'll do that just before painting so we don't break it off. So with our major sub-assemblies complete and the rest of the parts cleaned up, we're ready for painting and weathering. I also discovered a bit of a wrinkle in the assembly order. Step 6 has us attach the fenders prior to mating the superstructure to the hull, and here are the fenders once attached. The fit is good, but there were slight gaps to the rear where the fender mates with the superstructure. I wanted to leave myself a little play, so I didn't glue and press these rear sections together. Here's the dry fit of the hull and superstructure, and we can see more gaps where the rear of the fender mates with the hull. Tamiya engineered these parts presumably to be taken apart if, for example, the batteries in the hull needed changing. Tight seams weren't likely too much of a concern. We'll coax these pieces together tightly when we glue them up. Looking at the profile of the completed vehicle, if we install our running gear and if we install the tracks and the superstructure, it would be difficult to paint and weather everything below and underneath the fenders. As a result, I decided to paint and weather the tracks, the hull sides and running gear separately. I'll then assemble everything, clean up the gaps on the rear fender parts and paint the rest of the model. And that'll do it for this part one episode of our M5A1 build. Tune in again for part two where we paint and weather our Stuart. In the meantime, drop us a sub, a like or dislike, or just gripe in the comments. Or drop by the channel Tom's World for a neighborly visit and for a list of all our videos. In the meantime, it's bug the family for Christmas model season, so get your begging on. Until then, stay well and all the best.